Friday night, plagiarism versus diversity. New documents show Harvard's president borrowed other people's words time and time again. Why a plagiarism scandal can't trump the diversity industry at Harvard Yard. America the meek. They are looking for American leadership. The United States spends more on its military than anybody else in the world. Why we let the Arab world's poorest country attack our Navy without a response. Courting trouble. But you certainly supported an insurrection. How undermining the Supreme Court became a cottage industry. And policy or policy failure. Scenes on the border not seen in anyone's lifetime. Is amnesty the plan? Where are you going? And we start on the border with breaking news, live pictures. That is 6 p.m. in Eagle Pass, Texas. You can see not quite dark there, where thousands, if not tens of thousands, of illegal immigrants await processing by the Border Patrol. MSNBC, among others, call it a humanitarian crisis. The pictures earlier today were unlike anything we have ever seen. 12,000-plus people sitting on the banks of the Rio Grande. It is literally to borrow a phrase from the Statue of Liberty, the huddled masses. Republicans love to call Biden's border policy a failure. We'll look later in the show if that is the point, that the border situation isn't a failure of policy. It is the policy and keeps getting worse. A little later, we're going to explain why the more people who come across, the more leverage Mr. Biden gets and how the new year could bring a push for blanket amnesty, something the Biden administration has talked about before, or a policy proposal very similar to it. With that, we welcome you to the Ferris Show on television. First tonight, why Harvard's president won't get fired. More specifically, why she can't get fired. Firing her and continuing the diversity, equity, and inclusion experiment can't coexist. Those two thoughts can't exist in the same space. Firing her would concede a total failure of modern academia's most sacred cow. A new complaint filed at Harvard alleges Claudine Gay plagiarized in 40 separate academic works. That's roughly half of the papers she wrote. That is way beyond the original accusations against her. From the Free Beacon, quote, dozens of additional cases in which Gay quoted or paraphrased authors without proper attribution. They range from missing quotation marks around a few phrases or sentences to entire paragraphs lifted verbatim. Unlike so many in the cancel culture movement, we here on the show believe in the presumption of innocence. But we should note the Harvard Crimson newspaper already said they believe she violated the university's own academic integrity rules. You might remember the university board allowed her to amend two of her papers after their investigation last month. CNN reports Harvard's president's corrections do not address her clearest instances of alleged plagiarism, including those she's accused of having made as a student back in the 1990s. Harvard selected Claudine Gay as president because of her academic record, as well as her standing in the diversity Olympics. She's a black woman. She teaches African-American studies. Her thesis, Take Charge, Black Electoral Success and the Redefinition of American Politics, won Harvard's top award for best dissertation in political science. There are now serious questions. How much of that work, how many of those ideas were actually hers? But in the Diversity Olympics, facts don't matter. Everything. And the people behind DEI and diversity will tell you everything is defined by race and oppression. Remember, 40 allegations of plagiarism, nearly half of her scholastic work, claims against her that she stole full sentences to entire paragraphs with missing quotation marks. And look, Harvard takes these things very seriously when anybody but the president of the university does it. During the 2020 to 2021 school year, for example, the university recorded 138 cases of academic integrity violations, including 47 incidents of plagiarism. The university forced 27 students to withdraw that year. But for their president, Harvard's board appears to have whitewashed the investigation. Or more accurately, perhaps, there wasn't even a real investigation. As someone who works in media, I can tell you, when a person is investigated for plagiarism, the first thing 
real investigators do is go through every page of their past work. Yet Harvard didn't find all these other times she allegedly copied other people's work until someone at another university complained. And you saw the CNN reporting, independent verification backing up that these claims are real. A Washington Post headline explains the situation perfectly. Quote, criticism of Harvard's president is growing some see race as a factor. In other words, you can't criticize gay without the Washington Post calling you a racist. There's an irony, of course. She couldn't criticize pro-Hamas demonstrators on Harvard's campus. Can you but not say here that it is also... against the code of conduct at Harvard? We embrace a commitment to free expression, even of views that are objectionable, offensive, hateful. It's when that speech crosses into conduct that violates our policies against bullying, harassment, Does that speech not cross that barrier? Does that speech not call for the genocide of Jews? Went on to say it depends on the context. Firing gay threatens the entire DEI premise to which Harvard's board holds so dear. DEI sees everything based on past racial oppression, unless it's against Jews. And it specifically excludes meritocracy and objective standards. That's how DEI gets to the results it gets to. Plagiarism is an objective standard that is supposed to be applied without regard to where you land, where you place in the diversity Olympics. These two thoughts are at odds. To help us on this, Shan Wu, former federal prosecutor, one of the top officials at the DOJ, now the world expert in defending college students. It's good to see you, sir, um, you. as always. You've seen these passages that were allegedly right. copied and, and looked at a lot of this. If this was an undergraduate student who had done these things and hired you as defense counsel, would you say, uh, we got a problem here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's very little understanding, mercy, or context given to college students that are accused of plagiarism. Lots of times, they will have cited material someplace else in the work, but they forget to do it here, or they paraphrase. And some of that, frankly, Leland, even though they may be at big-name universities, poor training far down the line in really how you cite material. But there's no mercy for them. No mercy. Yeah. And, and look, she went to Phillips Exeter Academy. Right. She got her PhD at Harvard. This is a woman who's, who's been around the block a few times. Um, in your experience, is there a double standard now in what you're seeing in the way she's handled and the versus in the way that cases you've been involved in were handled? It, it certainly looks that way to me. Now, I wouldn't be able to agree with you that it's all because of DEI, but I would agree with you that when a person is powerful, well-established, there's often a double standard. She should be calling for a full review, not just of the most recent ones they did review, but all the way back to undergrad. It's just like you're saying. One of the worries I have as a defense counsel is if a student's accused of plagiarism on one paper, I want to know confidentially what are they going to find if they look at the other ones. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's not calling for that, right. although other people are doing it yeah. on their own. You say it's not because of DEI. Let me turn it around. If we are to concede that she was hired largely because DEI, and there's a lot of reporting on that, that the board, and you've dealt with a lot of college boards, they hate to admit they were wrong, right? If you all of a sudden have to start applying objective standards to something that is inherently not objective, which is DEI, right. that causes them a problem. Well, it shouldn't, because the true answer to that is it's not that we made a mistake with the DEI concerns. It's that we made a mistake in not detecting something that was covered up, or now that's been revealed to us, we need or to do something up. about it. How much of this do you think is involved in money? Harvard's endowment, $50 billion. That's higher than the GDP of Jordan, Tunisia, Libya, and about 90 other countries in the world. Uh, obviously, it grows tax-free, thanks to the U.S. taxpayer. Is there, is there part of this that so long as there's not more donors that pull out, already we understand that about a billion dollars has pulled out, Bill Ackman being the most... Uh, significant of that. How much of this is based on her sort of financial performance, you think? Probably a lot. I mean, if she is a star fundraiser, it's kind of like what you see in sports when you see star athletes are cut a break if there's alleged misbehavior or even criminal conduct. If they are making the franchise run, then a lot of people want to find a way around that. And those sorts of businesses, I mean, universities are like, you know, multi-billion multi multi dollar, dollar entities. Yeah. <laughs> Interestingly enough, Fareed Zakaria um, has been fairly outspoken on this, right. on this issue. We're going to play a clip from him on December 10th. 
a white man studying the American presidency does not have a prayer of getting tenure at a major history department in America today. Hiring for new academic positions now appears to center on the race and gender of the applicant. Are you seeing the pendulum swing back a little bit in more of a focus on fairness? In terms of plagiarism? No, no, just in terms of how universities are dealing with individuals both in hiring and in discipline. Um, I I think so. Uh, First of all, the the DI question is very complex, and a lot of respect for Reed's point there. We've seen a little bit with uh, Asian students when they're applying. Uh, frankly, admissions counselors will say, look, you know, you're kind of out of luck here because of your race. I mean, obviously, the schools won't say that. So there is a problem with how you deal with this complex issue of taking account into account diversity and past depression with a swing of the pendulum against fairness now, where you start bending over backwards the wrong way. Um, I'm seeing more awareness of that, but it's all at different levels. I mean, there's the high school senior applying, and then there are professors and presidents, yeah. And presidents, so it's, it's very different at each level. <laughs> it's good to see you, sir. You were the right guest for this. Thank you very much. <laughs> good to see you. All right, thank you. Coming up, uh, the last thing America needs this Christmas is to be dragged into another war. But we can't rule it out, given America's weakened standing on the world stage. It's something Secretary of State Antony Blinken was asked about twice today. None of the challenges we're dealing with are like flipping a light switch and you suddenly get total success. Countries throughout the region, as well as countries around the world, want to work with us and are looking for American leadership. President Biden appears to be so scared of starting a war that he will not take concrete steps to prevent one. Bloomberg reports the administration is considering strikes on the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels in an effort to prevent attacks by them and other Iranian-backed militias. Emphasis on considering. The administration tried to tear in these groups by sending two carrier strike groups to the Middle East. That didn't work. The Iranian militias launched more than 100 attacks on U.S. forces in the region. In a new op-ed, former Navy Captain Jerry Hendricks lays out a scary fact. The U.S. Navy isn't intimidating our adversaries like it used to. And that has less to do with the men and women in uniform and a lot more to do with the people who are calling the shots at the top. Remember, President Biden had a very clear message when he first took office. And I'm sending a clear message to the world. America is back. America is back. America is back. America is back at the table. Back at home, back at the table, and back to leading the world. Diplomacy may be back, but deterrence certainly isn't working, as evidenced by the fact that our foes aren't backing down. Congressman Michael Waltz is here, member of the Foreign Affairs Committee and the first Green Beret elected to Congress. Good to see you, sir. We appreciate it. I I think about what's going on specifically in the Red Sea, the Houthis attacking not only U.S. ships, but cargo ships, shutting down 10 percent of the world's cargo, oil up now almost 10 percent, coming soon to a gas pump near you. Am I wrong to go to that without meaningful deterrence against the Houthis, the, the idea of war over Christmas is not unthinkable? Well, Leland, let's just let's just go to why the, why does this matter? And you touched on it to everyday Americans. Fifteen to twenty percent of global shipping passes through uh, the Red Sea near where the Houthis are shooting in the Bab al Mendeb Strait and, and through the Suez Canal. Uh, and when that shipping is threatened, when deterrence fails, when our adversaries do not believe that we will hit back and therefore they can get away with it, the price of everything goes up insurance goes up, uh, shippers pull out, the price of oil goes up. And not only do we feel that at home in terms of inflation and the gas pump, guess who else benefits? Iran benefits from from, uh, the higher price of oil in their coffers. So you're in a negative cycle that now they're fueling the terrorists even more. And Russia benefits uh, with the higher price of oil. And guess what? It's not Iran's oil that is being shut down in the Red Sea. It's heading east to China. It's the Gulf states. So it's a it's a double or even triple win uh, for Iran. Hmm. And at the end of the day, uh, as you pointed out, uh, when the bully on the schoolyard doesn't believe you're going to punch him in the nose, when the bully in the schoolyard thinks, well, the kids are just going to keep offering more and more lunch money in the hopes that they'll back down, 
How do they read that? How do they read when Anthony Blinken and the president say, look, our top goal is to not escalate? They see that as opportunity, that they can get away with it, that they get those wins. Uh, and, hmm. and yes, I do think you, as long as they take this approach, you're going to see the bully push further and further and further until eventually we have to take action to stop them. All right, so that, that is what I guess John Kirby is trying to prevent. Uh, 37, 39 attacks, depending on how you count them, against cargo ships uh, and U.S. naval ships in that in the Red Sea, in the Gates of Grief, as you called it, um, in the Strait there. Uh, this is Kirby today on the new international task force led by the U.S. Navy uh, yesterday uh, talking about what's heading there. Take a listen. There's going to be a whole lot of hardware in the Red Sea now, naval hardware, not just from the United States, but other ships, other ships from other nations to counter these threats. What is oh the point God. of naval hardware if you're not willing to use it? Exactly. You can have the most capable military in the world, the most lethal, and the most ships. If your adversaries do not believe you have the political will to hit back, then it doesn't matter. But there's an opportunity cost here, too, Leland. Guess where those ships are coming from? They should be over in the Pacific, uh, but instead we now have to double the presence in the Red Sea, in the Mediterranean, because of a failed Iran policy, because they're flush with cash, because of our failed energy policy, and because have deterrence failed. Also, it has a horrible effect on readiness and recruiting. The USS Ford was supposed to be home by Christmas. They're now not going to be. Those ships were supposed to go into maintenance for a certain period so that they would be ready if we do get pulled into some type of hot war. Now they'll be in maintenance even longer because they've been worn out. So there's all kinds of ripple effects. And the thing that's so frustrating, this wasn't some type of natural disaster we didn't see coming. It's all a result of mm. bad policy, of an appeasement policy, and the fact that our adversaries don't respect and fear us any longer. Well, President Xi reportedly told President Biden uh, that they were going to reunify ta Taiwan, uh, Taiwan one way or the other. So you're, to your point, the world um, is watching. Congressman, if we don't talk to before, his sir, face, to his face on American soil, it's just unbelievable. Um, uh, <laughs> but it appears to have happened. Uh, Merry Christmas to you and yours, sir. If we don't talk before, thank you uh, for joining thank us. You. We appreciate it. Yes, sir. All right. We invite you to sign up for War Notes. It gives you a free look at the show every day at 4 p.m. You can go to warnotes.com and subscribe. The notes started as our internal email discussion about the most important events of the day. It's literally how we put the show together. You get to be a part of it. You can respond to the email with your thoughts or join us on social media at Leland Vittert on Instagram and Twitter. Warnotes.com and subscribe for free. Coming up next, four Democratic judges decided Trump shouldn't be on the ballot. Why you only hear about the politics of judges when they are Republicans. And from pre-K through high school, new evidence America's children are being taught, well, to hate Jews. Some of the lessons uncovered look like they could have been designed by Hamas. Unsurprising, they lead to this. The U.S. Supreme Court will will decide that Donald Trump should be disqualified from the ballot, given that conservative majority on that court. As much as we want to kind of divorce it and think about the Supreme Court as this kind of objective body that is, we all can sit here at the table and know that the Supreme Court is not that right now. The Supreme Court has been politicized. The Supreme Court has three Donald Trump appointees on it. Question the legitimacy of the Supreme Court is now a cottage industry on the left, all designed to delegitimize the Supreme Court. Now that the court will decide if Donald Trump can be on the ballot, it's an overdrive like Santa's elves right before Christmas. And it's working. The Supreme Court approval is at a record low. Only 40 percent of Americans trusted a huge drop from 60 percent back in 2000, the last time the court picked our president. And yes, Republicans appointed six of the nine Supreme Court justices. But here's what you didn't hear about yesterday when the Colorado Supreme Court ruled Trump couldn't be on the ballot. Democrats appointed all seven justices on that tribunal. And still three of them, including that court's chief justice, appointed by a Democrat, said the claim of Trump inciting insurrection and therefore disqualified under the 14th Amendment didn't work. 
Here now, former law clerk for Justice Antonin Scalia, Ian Samuel. And Ian, you're, you're in an unusual position, right? Scalia was incredibly conservative, but you were the liberal clerk. You were always the dissenting clerk that he hired to make sure uh, it made everybody smarter in the office, something I always admired about the late justice. Uh, I know you did, too. Why do you think it's only mentioned about the makeup politically of a court when that court is conservative? Well, I don't know if it's only mentioned in that context. There is one interesting difference between the Colorado Supreme Court's partisan makeup and the partisan makeup of the United States Supreme Court. And Colorado is my home state, so you'll have to forgive the inside baseball knowledge that this represents. I'm not just this much of a nerd. But uh, Republicans have not won a governor's race in Colorado for an extremely, extremely long time. The state party is highly dysfunctional. And so because the governorship has been controlled by the Democratic Party for so long, they've had the opportunity to nominate all seven of those justices. Justices. The problem, I think, with the Supreme Court of the United States is because the members of the Supreme Court serve for life and vacancies arise essentially at random. I mean, these are old people and just sometimes they, uh, you know, they die at different times. You can get a situation where, for example, President Trump gets three Supreme Court nominations in his first, um, you know, in his first term. Uh, just, you know, President Obama gets two Supreme Court nominations in his first term, none in the second term. Uh, and then you have presidents like Carter who get zero during their term. It's essentially random. And so even though Democrats have won the you know, national elections at the same clip as Republicans for quite some time, they don't have anything like that kind of representation on the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. And that makes the court feel out of step with what Americans have voted for in terms of control of their national government. And that is a real problem. People in Colorado can say, well, yeah, we've got a Democrat-dominated court. That's what we voted for. And that's true. Yeah. No, no that, 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 that's fair. And, and now we're entering into this phase where sort of courts are politically motivated. I, I thought it was interesting that there was so little given to the dissent in the Colorado Supreme Court, written by a Democrat, the chief justice. Uh, in the absence of an insurrection-related conviction, I would hold that a request to disqualify a candidate under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is not a proper cause of action under Colorado's election code. Therefore, I would dismiss the claim at issue here. And I think there's a lot of people who, who think that Donald Trump did um, very bad and wrong things, but fear the precedent this sets. Peter Meyer, who is a Republican who voted to impeach Donald Trump, uh, former member of Congress, if Trump's rhetorical culpability for January 6th qualifies, similar lawsuits against Democratic politicians who encourage BLM rioters will sif- swiftly follow. Was Kamala Harris giving aid or comfort when she fundraised bail money for rioters? You can imagine where this would go. And look, when you were on the Supreme Court and still to this day, it's a pretty insular world. And I'm wondering how much fear there is right now among people who love the court, whether they're on the left or on the right, about it's being put center stage in politics and and being delegitimized no matter what how it rules by both sides I think that there are, especially members of the court, who are extremely sensitive to that concern and really don't want the institution to be thrust into partisan politics in the way that it has now inevitably been. Because there are some issues where you could say, well, the court should let the people decide. But on an issue like this, where you have a lower state Supreme Court that has said that, you know, a major candidate is going to be ineligible for the ballot, the Supreme Court can't really just, you know, kick the decision to the political branches. It has to it has to participate. What I think will be appealing, at least to people like the chief justice, who's very concerned with institutional legitimacy and so on, is some kind of solution that allows um, the court to sort of at the most, you know, to the greatest extent it can uh, seem like it's not making a partisan decision. Here's one possibility. The court also has before it the question of whether uh, President Trump is officially immune for prosecution for the events of January 6th, the events leading to the special counsel's uh, you know, indictment in D.C. The former president has said that he is officially immune from that criminal prosecution at all. One outcome you could imagine from all of this is to say, well, he's not disqualified from the ballot, but he's also not immune from criminal prosecution either. If you want this guy to be your president, you can vote for him. And if the jury believes he's guilty, Hmm. they can convict him. Um, I don't know if that's the right result legally, but it sounds good, doesn't it? Doesn't it kind of sound good? (laughs) You know, you you bring up a great point that the the horse trading that can occur uh, in the chambers, if you will, around the table Uh, is something I think a lot of people wouldn't consider because they don't have the experience you do. Ian, it's good to see you. Thank you uh, for a great year of conversation. We'll see you in 2024, my friend. We've wondered a lot on this show about why half of young Americans, half of young Americans, support Hamas in the war against Israel. That brought chants like this to high schools around America. (laughs) 
from the river to the sea, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. That eliminates Israel. Where would kids learn that? Well, the free press found some answers about where they're learning it, how U.S. public schools teach anti-Semitism from pre-K lessons on ethnic noses to lectures on Israel as an apartheid state. Students are learning that Jews are the enemy. The article is written by Francesca Block. It exposes Brown University's Choices Program to educate students on how Israel is a Zionist enterprise in Palestine, an apartheid state, a settler colony, a military occupier. This is being taught in all 50 states to a million secondary school students. So now the chance makes sense. Images out of California on your left, Gaza on your right. While American students aren't being taught guerrilla warfare to kill Israelis, while they're still in kindergarten, that happens in Gaza, both sets of children are learning to hate Jews. This is an interview we had last week with a father from Connecticut whose son had to switch schools because he was being bullied for being Jewish. We got uh, uh, mean, uh, text messages that were very unfriendly that accused us of causing the problem as if it was our fault that someone had said to my son, you should go to Camp Auschwitz, exterminate all of the Jews. Mm-hmm. The school administration not only tried to buy our silence, they tried to buy my son's silence. Francesca Block, reporter at the Free Press, joins us now. Francesca, congrats on the great piece. We appreciate it. They can find it uh, on my Twitter account, and I know uh, on thefreepress.com uh, as well. Question to you. What happened to teaching kids two plus two equals four in kindergarten? Thanks so much for having me on, and that is a great question. Um, What I can tell you is that right now what we're seeing in public schools in America is new curriculum which encourages students to divide the world in a simplistic binary, to divide the world between the oppressor and the oppressed. And this is having profound consequences for Jews, for Jewish students. A recent poll just came out that said 67% of young people aged 18 to 24 now view Jews as oppressors, as the oppressor class, and believe they should be treated as such. And that's not too far away from many of the anti-Semitic tropes that have plagued Jews for hundreds of years. Hmm. Uh, This is uh, from California, 10th grade history course approved by the Santa Ana Unified School District from your reporting. Includes readings that call Israel an extremist, illegal Jewish settler population and accuse the country of ethnic cleansing. Uh, The Unified School District. Our goal is to ensure that our curriculum offers balanced and multiple perspectives from all groups involved in the Israel-Palestinian conflict. We aim to achieve this through an ongoing dialogue with community members about utilizing historical and academic content that adheres to all State Department of Education guidelines. Um, That seems to say something, just not answering the actual question. Did you find balance in this? I, I can't try to figure out what the balance to... Israel is a you know apartheid state that engages in ethnic cleansing and in illegal Jewish settler population. It, that that's exactly right. Many Jewish parents, families, organizations that were involved in opposing this curriculum brought out that exact point that it doesn't come across as balanced and that it does paint this one-sided perspective that is again leading to these ideas that real, real, Jews real, are real quick, for, forgive me forgive me for interrupting you, um, but I, I want to be fair about this. This isn't just rogue teachers, right? In some cases it is. In Oakland, for example, teachers, they organized a teach-in in in their schools that was not approved by the district in which they gave lessons about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that were not approved. Um, But Mm -hmm. in Santa Ana, for example, this is actually a course that was approved by the school board. And there's actually now a pending lawsuit against the school board for um, approving this curriculum. Parents and the ADL actually are involved as well as the Brandeis Center in saying that they didn't go through the correct processes to get this curriculum approved. Wow. Great, great reporting. Keep it up. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Coming up next, is the situation on the southern border a crisis or the Biden administration's plan to force Republicans hand? Live pictures right there. Gotta get rid of this old Backstreet Boys t-shirt. Tell me why. Because it stinks, boys. Tell me why. I've washed it so many times, but the odor won't come out. Tell me why. No, you tell me why I can't get rid of this odor. Have you tried Downy Rinse and Refresh? It doesn't just cover up odors. It helps remove them. Wow, it worked, guys. Yeah. 
Downy Rinse and Refresh removes more odor in one wash than the leading value detergent in three washes. Find it wherever you buy laundry products. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s message can be heard everywhere. His words change the nation. And though you might not know where the words came from, you can feel the truth behind them. We're now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We're confronted with the fierce urgency of now. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. called us all to service. Opportunities to serve those in need are all around you. And every time you volunteer to read to a child, serve a hearty meal, or clean up a park in your comunidad, his message becomes a reality. This January is your chance to let MLK's word inspire you to action. Learn how you can volunteer for a better tomorrow on MLK Day at americorps.gov forward slash MLK Day. I'm a pretty great multitasker. I can wash dishes and do laundry. I can roller skate while walking my dog. I can even order lunch while doing my homework. But I can't use my phone while driving. A distracted driver is one of the leading causes of death in the United States. So when it comes to driving, please... Don't be a multitasker. Don't drive distracted. A message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, and the Ad Council. This is an important message from the Mine Safety and Health Administration. Mining fatalities, accidents, and injuries are preventable. Taking a minute to approach your task safely can protect you and your fellow miners from injury and death. Staying alert and focused can keep you safe. Do it safe. Do it right. Whether buckling a seatbelt or securing equipment, these quick safety measures can prevent injuries and fatalities. Take time. Save lives. For more resources, visit MSHA.gov. You're listening to On Balance with Leland Vitter on News Nation, America's fastest growing cable news network. You're feeling pretty good. You just switched to Verizon 5G Home Internet. It's Verizon. Safe choice, right? Exactly. Maybe you won't mind waiting for everyone to log off so your network signal isn't congested. Oh, I love practicing patience. Maybe when your kids can't video chat grandma, they'll start writing her letters instead. Kim Kim would love that. It'll be great. And maybe the kids won't notice when you cut down their treehouse to get a better signal. Wait, trees block the 5G signal? Yep. It's time for better internet. Fast, reliable internet. Switch to Xfinity. Learn more at Xfinity.com slash Verizon 5G facts. When you use bounce dryer sheets and your clothes look amazing, it's the sheet. Less static in your life? Yeah, it's the sheet. Smelling fresher than ever? It's the sheet. Oh, so soft fabric? Ooh la la. It's the sheet. Less wrinkles on your clothes? You know it's the sheet. Bounce dryer sheets. More freshness, more softness. Less static, less wrinkles. It's the sheet. My mom has decided to learn to paint, and she's good. My dad's now into creative cuisine, and I've already put on six pounds. Learning new things comes with age. My mom? She started forgetting my name and what we're talking about. Forgetting well-known things doesn't. Memory loss may be a sign of Alzheimer's disease. Early detection gives you and your loved one time to plan for the future. Learn the warning signs of Alzheimer's at 10signs.org. Brought to you by the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council. Live pictures of Eagle Pass, Texas, where the thousands upon thousands of people come across every day. And while we've reported on the record number of illegal crossings for years and the crisis at the border, MSNBC showed up at Eagle Pass today with a slightly different take. By the way, this was like this on Monday. It was like this on Tuesday. It's still a large number of migrants because as they're being processed, more are coming in. You see them uh, holding those aluminum uh, mylar blankets to try to stay warm in the cold weather. As you can see, the banner this morning read humanitarian crisis, as if Customs and Border Patrol is creating a humanitarian crisis by detaining people who choose to come to America illegally. Other networks are doing the same as are politicians on both sides, is framing previews. What is about to come from the Biden administration? Humanitarian crises require drastic action. Kamala Harris said that drastic action would not be securing the border. It's very unfortunate, but it actually is is more than just unfortunate. It will have real consequence for these folks to play these kinds of games with who we are as America in terms of our role of global leadership. 
And let's be fair, there is a real problem. The number of illegal crossings keeps breaking records. 269,735 apprehensions recorded in September 2023. Highest month ever, 12,500 plus people encountered at the southern border yesterday. Highest single day on record. The immigration court backlog passed 3 million pending cases, up 1 million since 2022. 3 million, that's the population of Chicago, all here in America. One woman released into the United States today reportedly received a court date for 2031. Our Allie Bradley talked to people with court dates in 2029. They will all get to stay in America until then. The football stadium at Michigan holds roughly 100,000 people. It is called the Big House. You would need 30 big houses to hold all the illegal immigrants currently awaiting court hearings. Talk about a humanitarian disaster. MSNBC would shut up shop in the 30 big houses. Humanitarian disasters require bold moves like amnesty or some grand plan with Republicans. Every person now who crosses over the Mexican border gives Mr. Biden more leverage with Republicans going into an election year. Chris Landau, ambassador to Mexico from 2019 to 2021, joins us. Good to see you, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you. What do you make of the, the exponential growth in the number of people coming across? Well, Leland, it is so frustrating for me, given that our policies during the last administration really had reduced illegal border crossings to historically low levels. And this crisis that we're seeing now is a purely man-made crisis. There's not some hurricane that happened somewhere else that is driving this. This is happening as a result of our government's announced failure to apply our laws. That's so this, why is this a policy or failure of a policy? Oh, I think it's a policy. I mean, we have the laws on the books, and this government, the executive branch of this government, has said we're not going to enforce the law as if this was optional. I mean, it turns the Constitution on its head. The executive branch's job is to enforce the law, not pick and choose which laws it likes and doesn't Am like. Am I, like, play this out. Am I wrong to think that there's there's a plan here or that at some point, even if it's just incompetence over conspiracy, the answer to this has to be, if you have three million immigration cases growing to four million, grows exponentially, at some point it's like, well, we, we can't deal with all these, therefore we must just give everybody documents so they can work. I, I think that's right, Leland. I mean, I think the problem is these are human beings. They might have children here. They start to form ties here. Uh, then people say, well, it's very cruel to deport these people now that they have uh, formed uh, links in our communities. It's re- it is cruel to them. To be honest with you, it, it put uh, it's unfair not only to the people who are already here and the people who are waiting in line according to the law, it's unfair to the people who live in the shadows. I mean, we have great laws in our country, uh, but basically illegals don't get the benefit of those laws, right? I mean, they don't get the protections of OSHA and all that. They're working in the shadows. Right, because if they say anything, they, they right. end up getting... Throw, deported. Um, the Mexican president responding to Greg Abbott, who passed a state law that state officials can effectively deport folks who come across illegally. You're not going to win anything. He warned Abbott. On the contrary, he will lose sympathy because in Texas, there are many Mexicans, many migrants. He forgets that Texas was from Mexico, like 10 states um, in the American Union. He still seems a little bitter about that in, in the statement. But I'm wondering if we just sort of zoom out about how this continues to set records. It's compounding. The more people who get in and call back to the the home country, whether it be Mexico or Colombia or Ukraine or anywhere else, and say, I made it, how many people does that represent who come? And the flip side is, if people start getting sent back and people realize that they can spend all this money but are going to get deported, how many people does that stop? Listen, you are right to say that in our era of modern communications, there's probably no more effective tool for people to come than the phone and somebody saying, yes, calling the cousins in Honduras. The the one thing I would say that's really important for people not to lose sight of is that the migration problem at our southern border now is not primarily a Mexican problem. Mexicans are a minority of the people entering our southern border with Mexico at this point. You have people from over 180 countries, uh, Guinea, Angola, uh, China, Albania, Venezuela, China, not Russia. even to mention Yemen, Afghanistan. I mean, th- you know, just wait until th- th- there will probably be a terrorist attack one day from th- these people who are totally unvetted and coming into our country. Yeah. And it makes me sad that Mexico is, uh, you know, trying to 
uh, talk about these domestic issues. I mean, the Mexicans care a lot about their sovereignty. This is an issue about the United States domestic sovereignty. And that's a good that's a good point. They're more than happy to tell us what to do. Mr. Bastro, it was good to see you, sir. Pleasure. Thank Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you. A lot of pictures of the White House right now. Will President Biden be on the ticket come next November? Will Donald Trump? Predictions are never easy, so we're bringing in a pro. Cuomo's crystal ball when we come back. November of 2024, will Trump be the Republican nominee and Joe Biden be the Democratic nominee? To the latter, definitely no. I think Mr. Biden will not be nominated. And uh, I'm, if I, 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 I'd bet 51-49 against Trump. All right, George Will giving his prediction on the November 2024 outcome. New New Hampshire poll from St. Anselm College now shows Nikki Haley within 14 points of Donald Trump. Chris Christie behind Haley, 12, DeSantis, 6. Cuomo's here. All right, Cuomo, uh, time for your crystal ball. We're going to have a graphic made at some point. Cuomo's crystal ball, all right? Uh, Even money, would you take the even money bet of both Biden and Trump being the nominee and on the ballot November 2024? Yeah, I would take even money um, because it is 50-50. Look, George is being uh, indulgent of you because you're asking us to do this. My crystal ball uh, would absolutely be made of glass. Um, This is complete guesswork. I will say this. In the current environment, yeah, no, that yeah, we're hold, in. On, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's all it's all guesswork, okay? But, no, but the point is, is I, I like to ask people who are smarter than me, right? That's why I, I, I had Bill O'Reilly, I had you, now I had George. Come on. Uh, I don't know. Well, maybe George, but I think you can hang with this company very easily. Um, <laughs> all we have on you is time, not intelligence. But I'll tell you what. In 2016, um, I would have cashed in betting on the presidential election. Uh, in 2020, I would have cashed in because the dynamics were obvious. I have no idea what we'll be talking about this summer, brother. I really don't. Yeah. I don't know what war, what conflict at home, what will have happened, what make-believe thing the media makes, the madness of the moment. I have no idea where we will be. The game has changed. I, I think you're right about that. You make a great point. I will tell you this, though. Com- Here's one. You want a prediction? And I'll cut you off because, you know, that's what I do. Um, News Nation, and this is not gratuitous, News Nation is going to be a household name um, before this election is over. This is going to be seen as a place that helped change the game and disrupt uh, the establishment party structure. Hmm. And that's going to be the theme of this election. Disruption of the establishment. Yeah, on, on, on both sides. Uh, disrupting mm-hmm. the establishment is, is what is what we're seeing. All right. The tape is marked. Um, I, I am amazed at how you got out of the first prediction, but that's that's why you're I good at what I you do. I took even we'll money. The, yeah, okay, so you, took even, so you took even money that they will both be the nominees. Yeah, even money. 50-50. Yeah, I'll take it. All right. Sounds, sounds good. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. Have fun, my friend. Coming up next, not all Catholics like Pope Francis has moved to bless same-sex couples and liberalize the church. Coming up next, can a conservative movement bring the Bible back to church pews? But he's doing the right thing in social areas by saying, look, we're not going to make these kind of personal judgments. We're not going to allow gay marriage to be a sacrament. He can't do that. Pope cannot do that. But we're going to treat gay people and everybody else with compassion. That's what this is all about. It's Bill O'Reilly on the show earlier this week about the liberalization of the Catholic Church. For the first time, gay priests, for example, will bless. For the first time, Catholic priests will bless gay couples. That's not sitting well with some deep-pocketed American Catholics, including Tim Bush, founder of the Napa Institute that's rallying conservative Catholics. Good to see you, sir. We appreciate it. Um, Thank you, Lynn. Explain to me the, Explain to me the plan here. Well, I think Bill O'Reilly actually did a great job articulating it. I just would dissect it further. You know, the the mindset right today is that same-sex marriage and same-sex unions are embraced and endorsed by the Catholic Church. That is not what the Pope said. Um, Bill O'Reilly was very clear. That's impossible. Um, What he did say on Monday through the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, which he embraced, is that you are allowed to bless people 
who are in same-sex unions or same-sex marriages. And what kind of a blessing is this? This is not a sacramental blessing. It's not a blessing of the ritual of the same-sex union or marriage. It is simply a blessing on those individuals. And this is quite consistent with this papacy, Hmm. the field hospital concept, going out in in placing and asking for God's mercy and forgiveness on these or any other people, including all of us who are sinners. There's this feeling, though. There's this feeling, forgive me, but in in America, Vatican issues guidelines for same-sex blessings. Pope says homosexuality not a crime. Pope Francis pushes church to be more open to divorce. Pope Francis, Pope Francis has latest move to empower women in the Roman Catholic Church. There, there is this feeling that it's moving to the left, and part of that's because attendance is so far down. You called it the field hospital mentality of, uh, of trying to once again fill the pews, which have emptied out in America over the past uh, few years. I guess what's the point of preaching sort of a, a much more conservative doctrine if there's not people in the pews to hear it? I would submit uh, that <laughs> the more conservative uh, doctrine will bring more people back into the pews. You know, it's, it, I'm not trying to take exception with what the Pope is doing. I think COVID has a lot to do with people not being in the pews. They got out of the routine with churches closed down. We should have never done that, but we did it. And now we got to get people back. But I don't think you get them back by uh, being more inclusionary. I think you get, get them back by being uh, orthodox and consistent with your teachings. And this is very confusing to a lot of people, I, I, ho- I know the Pope is a plan, and I, and I'm, I, I hope he he does well with it. And I just I'm concerned that we don't uh, confuse people about what the Pope's teaching is and the Church's teaching, more importantly. 